A Rose for Emily. Part 3. She was sick for a long time. When we saw her again, her hair was cut short, making her look like a girl, with a vague resemblance to those angels in colored church windows, sort of tragic and serene. The town had just let the contracts for paving the sidewalks, and in the summer, after her father's death, they began the work. The construction company came with N, S and mules and machinery, and a foreman named Homer Barron, a Yankee a big, dark, ready man, with a big voice and eyes lighter than his face. The little boys would follow in groups to hear him cuss the N, S, and the N, S, singing in time to the rise and fall of picks. Pretty soon, he knew everybody in town. Whenever you heard a lot of laughing anywhere about the square, Homer Barron would be in the center of the group. Presently, we began to see him and Miss Emily on Sunday afternoons, driving in the yellow-wheeled buggy and the matched team of bays from the livery stable. At first, we were glad that Miss Emily would have an interest, because the ladies all said, of course, a Grierson would not think seriously of a northerner, a day laborer. But there were still others, older people, who said that even grief could not cause a real lady to forget noblesse oblige, without calling it noblesse oblige. They just said, poor Emily, her kinsfolk should come to her. She had some kin in Alabama, but years ago her father had fallen out with them over the estate of old Lady Wyatt, the crazy woman, and there was no communication between the two families. They had not even been represented at the funeral, and as soon as the old people said, Poor Emily, the whispering began. Do you suppose it's really so? They said to one another. Of course it is. What else could? This behind their hands. Rustling of craned silk and satin behind jalousies closed upon the sun of Sunday afternoon as the thin, swift, clop, clop, clop of the matched team passed. Poor Emily. She carried her head high enough, even when we believed that she was fallen. It was as if she demanded more than ever the recognition of her dignity as the last Grierson, as if it had wanted that touch of earthiness to reaffirm her imperviousness, like when she bought the rat poison, the arsenic. That was over a year after they had begun to say, poor Emily, and while the two female cousins were visiting her. I want some poison, she said to the druggist. She was over thirty then, still a slight woman, though thinner than usual, with cold, haughty black eyes, in a face the flesh of which was strained across the temples and about the eye sockets, as you imagine a lighthouse keeper's face ought to look. I want some poison, she said. Yes, Miss Emily. What kind? For rats and such? I'd recome. I want the best you have. I don't care what kind. The druggist named several. They'll kill anything up to an elephant. But what you want is... Arsenic, Miss Emily said. Is that a good one? Is... Arsenic? Yes, ma'am. But what you want? I want... Arsenic. The druggist looked down at her. She looked back at him, erect her face like a strained flag. Why, of course, the druggist said, if that's what you want. But the law requires you to tell what you are going to use it for. Miss Emily just stared at him. Her head tilted back in order to look him eye for eye until he looked away and went and got the arsenic and wrapped it up. The Negro delivery boy brought her the package. The druggist didn't come back. When she opened the package at home, there was written on the box, 
under the skull and bones for rats. Part four. So the next day we all said, she will kill herself. And we said it would be the best thing. When she had first begun to be seen with Homer Baron, we had said, she will marry him. Then we said, she will persuade him yet. Because Homer himself had remarked, he liked men. And it was known that he drank with the younger men in the Elks Club, that he was not a marrying man. Later, we said, Poor Emily, behind the jalousies, as they passed on Sunday afternoon in the glittering buggy. Miss Emily with her head high, and Homer Barron with his hat cocked and a cigar in his teeth. Reins and whip in a yellow glove. Then some of the ladies began to say that it was a disgrace to the town and a bad example to the young people. The men did not want to interfere, but at last the ladies forced the Baptist minister Miss Emily's people were Episcopal to call upon her. He would never divulge what happened during that interview, but he refused to go back again. The next Sunday, they again drove about the streets, and the following day, the minister's wife wrote to Miss Emily's relations in Alabama, so she had blood kin under her roof again, and we sat back to watch developments. At first, nothing happened. Then we were sure that they were to be married. We learned that Miss Emily had been to the jeweler's and ordered a man's toilet set in silver, with the letters HB on each piece. Two days later, we learned that she had bought a complete outfit of men's clothing, including a nightshirt, and we said, they are married. We were really glad. We were glad because the two female cousins were even more Grierson than Miss Emily had ever been. So we were not surprised when Homer Barron the Streets had been finished some time since was gone. We were a little disappointed that there was not a public blowing off, but we believed that he had gone on to prepare for Miss Emily's coming or to give her a chance to get rid of the cousins. By that time, it was a cabal, and we were all Miss Emily's allies to help circumvent the cousins. Sure enough, after another week, they departed. And, as we had expected all along, within three days, Homer Barron was back in town. A neighbor saw the Negro man admit him at the kitchen door at dusk one evening. And that was the last we saw of Homer Barron and of Miss Emily for some time. The Negro man went in and out with the market basket, but the front door remained closed. Now and then, we would see her at a window for a moment, as the men did that night when they sprinkled the lime. But for almost six months, she did not appear on the streets. Then, we knew that this was to be expected too, as if that quality of her father which had thwarted her woman's life so many times, had been too virulent and too furious to die. When we next saw Miss Emily, she had grown fat, and her hair was turning gray. During the next few years, it grew grayer and grayer, until it attained an even pepper and salt iron gray when it ceased turning. Up to the day of her death at seventy-four, it was still that vigorous iron gray, like the hair of an active man. From that time on her front door remained closed, save for a period of six or seven years, when she was about forty, during which she gave lessons in china painting. She fitted up a studio in one of the downstairs rooms, where the daughters and granddaughters of Colonel Sartoris's contemporaries were sent to her with the same regularity and in the same spirit that they were sent to church on Sundays with a 25-cent piece for the collection plate. Meanwhile, her taxes had been remitted. Then the new 
newer generation became the backbone and the spirit of the town, and the painting pupils grew up and fell away and did not send their children to her with boxes of color and tedious brushes and pictures cut from the ladies' magazines. The front door closed upon the last one and remained closed for good. When the town got free postal delivery, Miss Emily alone refused to let them fasten the metal numbers above her door and attach a mailbox to it. She would not listen to them. Daily, monthly, yearly, we watched the Negro grow grayer and more stooped, going in and out with the market basket. Each December, we sent her a tax notice, which would be returned by the post office a week later, unclaimed. Now and then, we would see her in one of the downstairs windows. She had evidently shut up the top floor of the house, like the carven torso of an idol in a niche, looking or not looking at us. We could never tell which. Thus she passed from generation to generation dear, inescapable, impervious, tranquil, and perverse, and so she died. Fell ill in the house, filled with dust and shadows, with only a doddering negro man to wait on her. We did not even know she was sick. We had long since given up trying to get any information from the negro. He talked to no one, probably not even to her, for his voice had grown harsh and rusty, as if from disuse. She died in one of the downstairs rooms, in a heavy walnut bed with a curtain, her gray head propped on a pillow yellow and moldy with age and lack of sunlight. Part 5. The Negro met the first of the ladies at the front door and let them in, with their hushed, sibilant voices and their quick, curious glances. And then he disappeared. He walked right through the house and out the back and was not seen again. The two female cousins came at once. They held the funeral on the second day, with the town coming to look at Miss Emily beneath a mass of bought flowers, with the crayon face of her father musing profoundly above the bier, and the ladies sibilant and macabre, and the very old men some in their brushed Confederate uniforms, on the porch and the lawn, talking of Miss Emily as if she had been a contemporary of theirs, believing that they had danced with her and courted her, perhaps, confusing time with its mathematical progression, as the old do, to whom all the past is not a diminishing road, but instead a huge meadow which no winter ever quite touches, divided from them now by the narrow bottleneck of the most recent decade of years. Already we knew that there was one room in that region above stairs, which no one had seen in forty years, and which would have to be forced. They waited until Miss Emily was decently in the ground before they opened it. The violence of breaking down the door seemed to fill this room with pervading dust. A thin, acrid pall, as of the tomb, seemed to lie everywhere, upon this room decked and furnished, as for a bridal, upon the valance curtains of faded rose color, upon the rose-shaded lights, upon the dressing table, upon the delicate array of crystal and the man's toilet things backed with tarnished silver, silver so tarnished that the monogram was obscured. Among them lay a collar and tie, as if they had just been removed, which, lifted, left upon the surface a pale crescent in the dust. Upon a chair hung the suit, carefully folded. Beneath it, the two mute shoes, 
and the discarded socks. The man himself lay in the bed. For a long while, we just stood there, looking down at the profound and fleshless grin. The body had apparently once lain in the attitude of an embrace. But now the long sleep that outlasts love, that conquers even the grimace of love, had cuckled at him. What was left of him rotted beneath what was left of the nightshirt had become inextricable from the bed in which he lay. And upon him and upon the pillow beside him lay that even coating of the patient and biting dust. Then we noticed that in the second pillow was the indentation of a head. One of us lifted something from it, and leaning forward, that faint and invisible dust dry and acrid in the nostrils, we saw a long strand of iron-gray hair, the end.